When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Völke hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. Völke hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. Hello and welcome to Revolutionary Socialist Review. This is Chris Driscoll, and along with me, my co-host, collaborator, politically speaking at least, uh, on this show, uh, partner in crime, Rainer Shea. How are you doing, Rainer? Hello. This election has exposed some... Uh some things about our current conditions that I was uncertain about. Like <laughs> how much potential has, does Trump have to steal the election? And this, this is kind of clarified that Trump doesn't, doesn't realistically have a chance of uh, subverting uh, the so-called democracy of carrying out a coup. It, I mean, it's not like a ruling class would allow for the system to be destabilized so much. And it's not like they would allow for uh, the, uh, the whole situation to escalate into lone uh, uh, unmaskless dictatorship. And, uh, so the, the Caitlin Johnstone had a headline this week joking about how a totalitarian dictator to leave office after losing election, which was <laughs> uh, pointing out the, uh, the absurdity of how Trump has often been portrayed by uh, his opponents. It's, it's like uh, the, US, the U.S. ruling class has been trying to draw a line between uh, their their model like like their establishment model which is supposedly uh aspirational democracy uh and between uh trump who is uh, supposedly a total break from this and a, a total break from the norm and and something entirely alien to what america is but uh but uh, the the united states has always been uh authoritarian in favor of the interests of capital and in favor of white supremacy and imperialism. Yeah, uh, America's a dictatorship, but it's a dictatorship of the capitalist class. It's a, uh, yeah, you no, know, 20, 30,000 people who are the dictator <laughs> collectively. Um, and they do appoint a CEO that's Trump, uh, otherwise I, known as the emperor. That's what I call him. I think that's what we should all start calling him. Um, and he does have enormous power, way more than a, than a normal uh, country in this world. Uh, in fact, he has more power than any other single human being ever in the history of humankind. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a little bit of a misnomer about what dictatorship means. Uh, there, there's never, ever, ever been a single human being who was all powerful, like a god who could uh, dictate everything. I mean, that's just not real in the real life. Yeah. The word dictator comes from the Roman use of the word and the dictator in Rome was a special emergency uh, a position appointed for six months or elected by the 
uh, by, by the Roman Senate for six months. Um, and it was an extremely powerful position, like the American presidency is. Uh, it, it, the president, the, the dictator in Rome during those special rare times, emergency times when they felt they needed it, um, had uh, really big powers, but no more so than the American president today. So if you consider the origin of the word dictator coming from the Roman um, Republic, uh, that uh, use of the term fits the American president perfectly because the, uh, the American president ever since FDR in the 1940s has been given dictatorial powers by the ruling class because the ruling class thinks that they're in an emergency, that they've been in, emer in an emergency, an emergency of uh, the, 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 the existential necessity to cr grow their empire, which is a, all they've been doing since uh, the 1940s. So in that sense, um, Trump really is a dictator, but in the sense that most Americans think of the word dictator, and the, obviously Caitlin Johnston does too, um, of being this all-powerful, godlike human being that can, uh, you know, just dictate anything, and it just happens. Uh, no, he's not that, and in, and there has never been that in the whole whole entire world, but. Uh, there, you know, there's always a lot of misconfusions with Americans because Americans really don't have any historical back uh, grounding. They have no uh, political grounding, no political th theoretical grounding. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the real dictatorship in America is the dictatorship of a class, the capitalist ruling class. Okay, um, yes, it's been a hell of a ride, and we're not over yet. I mean, we don't know what the hell Trump's going to do. Trump still has a lot of power over, like, you know, maybe a quarter of the American adults in America who are cultish about him, who have a cult of personality around him. So, you know, who knows what he's going to tell them to do, what he has already told them to do. We'll just have to wait and see on that. Meanwhile, this is a really, uh, I'll start out here, the first topic of the night, leveraging the ruling class's loss of legitimacy. This is a great article by um, a guy named, uh, what was his name? Hold on here, I'll get it. Uh, here we go. Um, Roger Harris. Roger Harris is on the board of the Task Force on, on the Americas, a 32-year-old anti-imperialist human rights organization. And uh, this article appeared in um, uh, Counterpunch, I believe. In, yes, in Counterpunch, which usually has a lot of bad shit recently, but so I hardly ever even look at it anymore, but this one was good. Uh, the one good article I found over a whole week's worth of counterpunch articles. Anyway, um, Roger Harris, uh, he, he starts by uh, uh, saying that the Trump defeat uh, was a blow to overt white supremacy, but bedrock institutional racism entombed in the U.S., Carceral, I'm not even familiar with that word. Carceral, you, un, you know that word? Anyway. Carceral, uh, carceral car I think. Carceral, what does that mean? I believe it means prison system, like, like in mass incarceration. Oh, okay. Entombed in the U.S. carceral state will still endure, and the tasks of the left will remain. Good point, I thought. Um, Harris went on to blast communist and socialist parties uh, that backed um, Biden. Uh, he says the contribution of those part-time leftists who campaigned for Biden 
was not to put him into the White House. They didn't have the numbers to do that, but to help legitimize neoliberal rule. And that's exactly what these idiots in the Communist Party and the uh, Democratic Socialists of America and so forth, uh, many, many others, the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party, for example, that's what they were up to. They were legitimizing neoliberal rule by backing Biden, the poster boy for neoliberalism. Politi the politics of fear obscured critical issues, says Harris. The uh, financial elites disproportionately lavished their support on Democrats, Harris said. While the outcome of the presidential election is uncertain, of course, this was written last week. It was written uh, prior to the uh, the announcement on Saturday that uh, Biden had won. The announcement by the networks, because of course there has still to this day been no official announcement of who won the election. But according to the networks, who uh, the, the billionaire-owned uh, TV networks who apparently now uh, decide these things, uh, Biden has won. Anyway, he says, while the outcome of the presidential election is uncertain, the legitimacy of the ruling class has surely been sullied by the argu arguably ugliest campaign in recent history. The elite club must now figure out how to anoint their new emperor without further damaging their image. Uh, their image, the hiccups over their transfer of power, is their dilemma and our good fortune. Um, good point. He's making the point that these are the fissures that we in the left should be exploiting not helping Biden to overcome, you know, not giving him a, a, a honeymoon period or any such idiocy that a lot of leftists these days are saying. While, the pre while President Donald Trump has cast doubt on whether he will commit a peaceful transfer of power, CNN revealed, uh, this is a, actually a quote from CNN. CNN says, Donald Trump uh, has cast doubt on whether he will commit to a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, the secretive pro CNN revealed the secretive process to prepare a would-be Biden administration has been underway for months with help from top Trump officials. That's pretty astounding if you think about it. Uh, so they're going behind Trump's back, obviously. Uh, top Trump officials, whoever the fuck that is. You know, that's the best we'll get from the uh, liberal press. This is a time to, uh, to leverage the ruling class's loss of legitimacy to articulate a left alternative. I totally agree with that. Progress the progressive agenda has been ignored, says Harris, uh, and suppressed by the duopoly. And then he goes on to make a big list, effectively addressing a global warming, COVID safety over economic activity and economic relief, ending forever wars and sanctions while de-escalating the threat of nuclear conflagration, national health care program modeled after Medicare, Opposition to the, to the militarization of the police and pres preservation of civil liberties. Reduction of income inequality. Stronger antitrust laws. Fairly taxing wealth. These were among the critical issues that were lost in the distracting political theater of the 2020 campaign. And the basis for a renewed left initiative. So what are your thoughts, Rainer? Yeah, I've seen all these groups go all in for Biden, Democratic Socialists of America and Bob Avakian's organization and saw the, one. the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party. Yeah, yeah. Bob Avakian 
he, he's, uh, he's bad news overall. He, he seems like an opportunist. Apparently he, he wants work to, he's worked to divide the, the uh, communist movement and be kind of ultra. And uh, they were part of the, one of the factions that split from, uh, from China during the Sino-Soviet split. So they're, they're part of that, uh, that whole development. And now they do things like uh, help prop up the Democratic Party, which is, it, it's, it's, it seems so hypocritical. And these groups always use the justification that, that they always use the rationalization that uh, you have to vote for Biden because it, it, uh, it's, it's essential for protecting the country from, from Trump from a Republican and uh, yeah I, I mean it it's it's kind of an unwinnable argument if somebody's priority is to uh, is to elect a Democrat over a Republican and uh, and if they're not interested in uh, trying to weaken the state you your approach towards it has been to refrain from voting uh, and I, I think another approach is voting third party, particularly for the PSL candidate, Gloria Lariva, uh, but definitely not for, for Biden. I don't think any communist should vote for Biden. And I think it's a symptom of petty bourgeois reformism. And that's, uh, that's all, which has always uh, uh, infected the labor movement in the United States because yeah. there's, Kind of a natural incentive to become petty bourgeois to fall into reformism when you're living in the United States. The the only alternative would be would be to totally break from the system so that you can pursue a route that's that's so that would require such a sacrifice on your part and so and so much work towards trying to subvert existing institutions. I'm talking about people's war. I'm talking about trying to, about doing the work to win over these uh, local uh, populations so that they could potentially support you in your party's efforts to break away from the capitalist state. And uh, this is going to require a uh, I think several more steps in the collapse of the United States, the contradictions are going to be heightened to the point where most of the American population no longer feels like, uh, like aligning with imperialism is in their best interests. And it's going to require uh, a huge strengthening of our organizations. We're going to need to grow. We're going to need to educate the masses. We're going to need to get equipped, not just with arms, but with medical supplies, with uh, with uh, self uh, defense training, with uh, all these uh, these resources that we would practically need to go up against the state, like yes. how Shea did. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a time of education, primarily and a time of uh, preparation, agitation and organization as well. But uh, those four areas are crucial for us. Mint Press asks the question in a really great article, I thought, did media spiking the Ukraine Burisma story win Joe Biden the election? I thought that was a, a really fascinating um, article. Uh, it's uh, f from a uh, guy who uh, we've mentioned in the recent past, what's his name, McLeod. Uh, uh, he's on the uh, Mint Press. Uh, 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 he, he's on the Mint Press um, uh, editorial team. And um, yeah, basically in this article, you can go to Mint Press, uh, mintpressnews.com, I think it is, 
and uh, find it on, on, on your favorite search engine. Um, the uh, article basically asks the question, you know, the, uh, the uh, Hunter Biden, Burisma story in Ukraine, um, and the fact that uh, the uh, New York Post um, published an article about it, and it was generally the entire, almost the entire bourgeois media, which is almost all liberal, um, uh, refused to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, even those that did, like the New York Times, um, you know, spent the whole article trying to uh, 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 debunk the story w when, in fact, uh, there's way too much uh, solid evidence uh, that this is a real story uh, to ever debunk it. Now, you know, the actual uh, laptops that uh, Hunter Biden's uh, abandoned, uh, were they real, were they not? I don't really think that matters because we've established that this story was fact long before they got this. They're making a big deal out of this because it's just one more nail in the coffin of uh, Biden, Joe Biden, the whole Biden crime family, as I explained in last week's show. Refer back to last week's show if uh, uh, you didn't see it. And, um, the, you know, it's to me, it's just very well established. But He's asking, what role did this play in the uh, election? I think it played a real big uh, role. Uh, and um, McLeod from the uh, Mint Press thinks so too, obviously, because he spent the time to write an article about it. Uh, what are your thoughts, Rainer? Yeah, this definitely isn't the first time we've seen something uh, along these lines where the media kind of lies by omission during election time in order to uh, protect a particular candidate. Uh, it, it, it's, this seemed to happen perhaps many times throughout 2016 with Hillary Clinton where firstly there, there were all these uh, the, the, there were all these scandalous activities within the democratic primaries where uh, uh, people tied to Hillary Clinton or the, these these corrupt officials within the Democratic Party uh, carried out election fraud and voter suppression and and throwing out ballots and the the media uh, either ignored it or tried to debunk it. Uh, there is, there's also the, the WikiLeaks revelation, which the media responded to by creating a counter narrative about how Russia had, uh, had uh, hacked, hacked our democracy, uh, which became the slogan for the next uh, four, four years or so. And uh, now during this time, amid this, uh, the, the revelation of this Biden related scandal, the media has not just tried to omit it or uh, dispute it in a kind of a disingenuous way, but also inserted the familiar lines about how these foreign powers are supposedly flooding the US with disinformation, trying to, to subvert our so-called democracy uh, uh, and uh, the targets this time are not just Russia, but also China and Iran. Uh, so the, here, here, these are the trends we've been seeing in these these last five years, in these these last two elections, as geopolitical tensions have been heating up and as class conflict has been increasing. The media has tried to keep a cap on the emergence of narratives that go, uh, the emergence of facts that go against their liberal narratives by uh, either ignoring stories or trying to uh, kind of disingenuously uh, debunk them or uh, flooding the discourse with garbage about how Russia or Iran or China have, uh, have been uh, engaging in these 
either exaggerated or fabricated plots. So yeah. We, yeah. We might see more of it during the Biden years and beyond. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Did I step on your toes? N no. Okay, good. I, I you, you just, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, distorted out for a second there, so I wasn't quite sure. Anyway, next on our list by Rainer Shea, another great article, by the way, kudos on that. The U.S. ruling class aims to use war to regain stability. Take it away, Rainer. Doesn't this kind of pertain to what I was, I was just saying about how the U.S. ruling class, particularly the liberal wing, uh, have, has been uh, trying to counter the rise of, uh, of uh, information relating to class struggle and to the contradictions of capitalism and imperialism and U.S. war crimes by injecting uh, the discourse with uh, with these uh, these disingenuous stories about how Russia hacked our election, about how uh, the, uh, the U.S. is uh, is being targeted in, in some way by uh, by nefarious Chinese or Iranian actors. Right. Uh, it, this 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 stuff goes far beyond the haphazard. Uh, hoaxes that the Trump administration has tried to come up with at times that let, like involve uh, Iran trying to develop WMDs or uh, or Venezuela in engaging in narco terrorism. This stuff is deeply ingrained into our uh, cultural landscape by uh, pretty much ubiquitous media propaganda and the common thread is war, war propaganda, war propaganda with the purpose of perpetuating the 19 years running cycle of, uh, of direct warfare. You could argue that it that our, we've been at war in different ways uh, before 9-11, but throughout my whole lifetime, uh, there's there's been a war uh, pretty much throughout my whole lifetime, there's been wars going on, and the U.S. ruling class aims to keep these wars going because uh, war helps keep alive U.S. capitalism amid the crises that it's experiencing. Uh, U.S. global hegemony is waning overall with the with the rise of Russia and China, and with the destabilization of U.S control over the Middle East and other regions. And amid the uh, collapse that, uh, the, amid the, the accelerated stage of collapse that global capitalism has been experiencing since 2008 with, uh, with the first great crash and then in 2020 with the next even greater crash and amid COVID-19, the global capitalist class is looking for uh, big break. They're, they're looking for the kind of big break that historically wars have been able to provide, wars and conquests. We, we saw this uh, during the Great Depression, which was uh, uh, answered with by the instigation of a new great war by the imperialist powers, where uh, the U.S. Uh, we really became uh, determined to start a new war to uh, to try to expand their imperial control, and uh, this war resulted in, in, in increased living standards in many respects for the American population. The the U.S. attained a, a, a really significant war economy during the 1940s that had been. Uh, uh, apparently, from what I know, uh, pretty much absent from the, the U.S. Uh, in the decade or so prior to them uh, due to the strong anti-war uh, sentiment that, that prevailed within U.S. politics. Uh, but as of World War II, uh, and the, the U.S. has been 
steadily expanding its imperial control, as you say, and it's been steadily uh, trying to build up its war machine, as Eisenhower warned about in his military industrial complex speech. And uh, now in the, in the 21st century, the military industrial complex is really deeply ingrained within the U.S. economy. It, I, in my article, I cite uh, a 2008 piece that argues for how uh, the U.S. economy is essentially a war economy. War drives so much of uh, entrepreneurship within the United States. It, it fuels business and uh, and this is why the ruling class is so determined to uh, keep the perpetual war paradigm going because it uh, it fuels business at a time when uh, capitalist economies are rapidly shrinking and unemployment is skyrocketing and when it gets, it's getting harder harder to exploit labor uh, so in these in this next decade the, the worrying thing is that Washington will instigate a uh, World War III to uh, to try to kickstart the, the empire again. The, of course, the dilemma here is that if the U.S. were to start a war with Iran, Russia, China, even Venezuela, it it would it, it would most certainly lose, and it would be uh, it, it would create a real crisis for itself where it. Uh, even in, in, in Venezuela, uh, actually not surprisingly in Venezuela, because Venezuela has a million strong socialist Chavista army. If the U.S. were to invade there, it would be another Vietnam. And the U.S. can't afford a catastrophe like Vietnam now, not when the empire is in decline. Yes. Um and of course, well, Venezuela, not only do they have the uh, uh, one, almost one million strong standing army, but they also have a uh, militia that uh, has uh, more than two million uh, weekend warriors, but well, well trained and very uh, motivated and highly dedicated. Uh, weekend warriors. They're not America's weekend warriors who do it for the extra cash. Uh, they're uh, they're committed. Uh, they're they're committed Bolivarians. So yeah, this that would be insane. Um, but you know, this really it strikes me when I was reading your article. It struck me they they have nothing new. Uh, they have they they have no, no uh, new tricks in their bag. These are all the same old tricks. They've been uh, relying on the war economy since World War II. So, from 1941 until today, the America has been uh, on a war economy, on a war footing, really. Uh, uh, a, uh, on an economy that uh, is utterly reliant on war, utter rely, utterly reliant on war, not just for the uh, sake of keeping the economy going, but it's utterly reliant on it uh, because it's the uh, ruling class's only means of survival because they are, uh, they have a uh, a political an e uh, political economy that uh, is utterly dependent on constant growth, uh, constant uh, expansion of the uh, empire. So they really need this war economy. They need uh, an imperial kind of economic system, and they certainly have it. Uh, and it is a system that is not sustainable. It is definitely not sustainable. It will collapse in the long term. And unfortunately for them, maybe fortunately for us, we're nearing the end of that long term because it's been a long, long time since they started this idiocy. Anyway, uh, 
Let me see. Next on our list, Putin will not congratulate Biden until results are official and uh, legal procedures are complete, uh, the Kremlin announces. Um, th this has got a lot of uh, liberals in America that got to got to get their uh, panties in a twist, you know, panties up in a wad, up uh, up the wazoo, so to speak. Uh, and you know, it just shows the liberal uh, hypocrisy, because uh, on the one hand, this is or has always been the Russian Federation, ever since the Russian Federation came into existence in uh, 1992, uh, this has been their policy, that they do not interfere in foreign elections, which includes they're not going to be going, uh, you know, like all these uh, imperialist countries have already done. They're not going to go and congratulate Biden for an election that has not even been announced yet. The, you know, the fact is that the networks are not the officials who are, to who are supposed to be announcing uh, the uh, official results of the election. Uh, they are supposed to report what the officials announce, but the officials have not announced anything yet in the United States because the election's not over, the counting is not over. Here in Arizona, they're still counting. In uh, 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 Georgia, they're still counting. In uh, Pennsylvania, they're still counting. And yet, these networks have already announced this. Well, you know, I mean, if people would understand what this is, which is these guys are making a good guess. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just opinion. It doesn't mean that Biden is the uh, uh, president-elect. And the uh, Russian Federation is sticking to its policy that it has always had of never interfering in the uh, elections of other countries. And yet these hypocritical liberals are blasting President Putin for this. And they were the same people who've been blasting President Putin, claiming in their Russiagate hoax that President Putin interfered in their election in 2016. Well, it's just not true. It's never been true. It's based on lies. It's not based on any evidence at all. And yet they keep repeating the lies. And yet, when uh, Putin is here demonstrably showing that uh, he will not interfere in the elections of another country, which it would be, it would be interfering in our election for any head of state of a foreign power, including England and France and Germany, which have just done that. It's an interference in our election for them to be congratulating uh, Biden uh, as though he had won the presidency when he has, in fact, uh, not, not yet. I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say the networks are right. <laughs> it's looking pretty, uh, pretty sure in that way. But I'm not the person who announces this either. There are election officials who announce this, and they have not spoken yet because they're still counting. Anyway, um, I thought uh, th this, this uh, article uh, uh, comes from um, Sputnik News, I think, Sputnik uh, Radio. Uh, there you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it, it shows the hypocrisy of these narratives that the liberal wing of the U.S. ruling class uh, it engages in uh, when it uh, it tries to spin these uh, these these uh, stories about how Russia is subverting American society uh, and uh, yeah yeah the, you 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 said it you you said it that uh, that now the liberals are mad that Putin is 
it's not interfering. That uh, once again, I'm I'm uh, I'm eager to see what kinds of rhetorical tactics they'll use in these next four years, because it's going to be absurd as always, uh, but, uh, but a legitimate threat is censorship against, uh, against those who seek to challenge these absurdities. And I wonder how, how this country will look like four years from now, or eight years from now. Uh, Biden is going to uh, continue to tighten censorship against anti-imperialist voices. Uh, Biden is going to continue with, uh, with this war on dissent that's been going on uh, particularly since 2016 and since the start of the new Cold War with Russia at, at around uh, 2013 or so with, uh, with the preparations for the uh, the coup and proxy war against against Russia and Ukraine that Washington carried out in 2014. Uh, so, uh, so these next four years, we're going to see uh, so far the the epitome of uh, uh, censorship and uh, and propaganda and uh, and deception from uh, the forces of liberal authoritarianism. They, they present themselves as the bastions of democracy, but this is just another layer to how they, 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 uh, they spin these deceptions. Nothing will fundamentally change in these next four years, and the hand of, uh, of uh, corporate and state control over discourse will, will tighten. Absolutely. Absolutely. Topic number five, uh, the Communist Party of China proposes for China, uh, or proposals, I'm sorry, for China's 2021 to 2025 development plan and long range goals through 2035. And this is part of the next five year plan, which uh, will begin in 2021 and last through 2025. <laughs> this was an article in um, uh, Global Times, which is one of the two major uh, Communist Party newspapers of China. And um, it is, uh, it, it, it is it, in, in my opinion, uh, it's a, an article that uh, uh, it, it, it really... Uh, impresses me because um, it's about how the uh, it's not so much about what they're going to do and I think we already pretty much know that but I'll kind of sum it up what they are going to do in this next five-year plan and in the long-term long-range goals through uh, 20, uh, 2035 uh, but this article uh, in the uh, Global Times, you can look it up on the Global Times English version, look up Global Times uh, in, uh, uh, in your favorite search engine, uh, and you'll find it. Uh, and uh, it's basically, it's about the process that the Communist Party uses as the leading uh, organization we should also mention that it's the largest political party in the history of humankind. With I, th I thought I, I I saw someone I, I saw someone message me and say that they they don't think you're right. They 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 say that the Communist Party of India is the largest the largest Communist Party, right? I, so, <laughs> are they the ones? I'm sorry, are, but that's. Uh, you know that's absurd. Uh, we'll look that up and uh, and and dispel that rumor. But the Chinese Communist Party is the largest uh, political party uh, in the world today. It's the lar it, it's certainly the largest ruling uh, party in the world today. Uh, it, it in my opinion is the largest political party in history. 
I don't think there's ever been a political party with, with 94 million dues paying members and not in an organization like the Co Chinese Communist Party, which it takes a little bit uh, uh, to get into. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy. Uh, you don't just walk up and, uh, you know, say, uh, hey, government register me for the Communist Party like you do with the Democrat Party, you know. Uh, and Democrats don't pay dues to their party. Uh, anyway, um, the, uh, this uh, development plan, as I said, is part of the five-year plan. Um, between July and September, President uh, Xi presided over seven symposiums to solicit opinions and suggestions from entrepreneurs non-CP personages, uh, experts in uh, economic and social fields, scientists as well as experts in uh, education, culture, uh, health, and sports. Uh, comments, and these are a little bit uh, quotes from the article. Comments were also solicited online and in just two weeks over one million pieces of comments were collected. President Xi asked relevant departments to sort, analyze, and absorb the comments uh, and urged further efforts to use the internet to listen to people's voices. The task of collecting suggestions for the development plan proposals has been unprecedentedly extensive, said a member of the drafting group. Xi uh, convened a series of high-level meetings, including three meetings of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee to review the draft document before it was submitted to the fifth plenary session of the ninth on 19th CPC uh, Central Committee. Essential requirements include strengthening China's economic, technological, and composite capacity development in new industrialization and the modernization of China's system and capacity for governance. The communique calls for more efforts to boost the well-rounded development of society, including social etiquette, civility, and the advancement of eco-friendly ways uh, of work and life. The, the, this uh, uh, plan I know from other uh, reading in the past couple of months, um, it heads further into the direction of uh, making China a more uh, consumer-oriented economy, an economy that's based more on its own consumers, number one, uh, that's based more on um, uh, reaching out and uh, even more so than it has already been doing, reaching out and helping to develop its neighbors in Asia, in Africa, in uh, uh, and, and even in uh, Europe uh, and in uh, South America as well. Um, and it, it, it uh, definitely emphasizes uh, certain types of uh, technology that will advance the entire economy, like AI is a very important area of development. Um, the uh, 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 development of uh, an ecologically sound uh, 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 type of economic system that relies more on sustainable uh, development rather than just uh, heavy industrial development as uh, China has uh, had to do in the first part of its uh, development. So it's pretty impressive when you think about it, and pretty impressive the way they have reached out to all sectors of society, how the uh, Communist Party is really uh, more a conduit between the people 
in the government than anything else. I mean, that's the major role of the Communist Party in China is to be a conduit back and forth to uh, feed uh, the needs and wants of the people to the government because this is, after all, a, a work uh, a socialist workers state, a state run by workers. So what the working class says is all important. Uh, but to feed the opinions of the workers and the needs and wants of workers to the government and then for the government to analyze all that and to respond about how they're going to meet these needs and wants and desires of the workers. It's really an impressive uh, way to run a country, much, much different than anything we ever see in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Now that the person who messaged me, now that you, I see your reaction to their objection, I, I, I see how absurd a position they were coming from because they were so confident that the Communist Party of, 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 uh, of China is is not the the biggest party, and I, I remember they they tried to point to the party in, in India. So, uh, so yeah, some, some the Marxist parties in India are very large. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I don't think any of them has 94 million dues-paying members. Um, yeah, I'll yeah. go look. I'm gonna go look now that now that you've raised this. I'll go look and see. Yeah, well, uh, this is uh, update on what sounds like some uh, some recent uh, moves by the leadership to develop the productive forces uh, yeah. of, uh, of the, the country. And also the, the sounds like the consumer forces, like, like, uh, like this is, this is an extension of what China has been doing uh, since it's post Mao reforms, it, it market reforms that entail an opening up and, and that entail uh, the necessary developments that that the, the country has needed in order to get the, those uh, 900, 900 something million people out of poverty who were still in poverty uh, at the time of Mao. So, uh, so this, this, uh, this five year plan, it's, it's one more step towards uh, China gaining the material resources that it would require in order to achieve communism. A little while ago, I saw you were on my Facebook page and you said, no, let, let's, let's, not, let's not overestimate uh, the reality. Let's not uh, uh, deny that strides continue to need to be made before China can uh, uh, attain the resources needed for uh, moving towards communism because because uh, China ha does not yet have the capacity to become a uh, full-blown communist uh, who knows when this will be able to happen uh, it, it'll it'll uh, of, of course ultimately it won't be able to happen until global imperialism is is defeated and until these class antagonisms are abolished and which will, uh, but after that point, the state and uh, classes will be able to be abolished entirely and the state will be able to uh, disintegrate into something that loses its political character, which is, is the ultimate goal of Marxism. I've heard the year 2050 mentioned as, uh, as potentially important in China's development towards socialism 2050 and 2049 2049 which is the 100th year anniversary of the liberation yeah yeah it will also be shortly after hong kong is fully integrated into china which will be really the, the end of uh, european colonialism there so uh, we have some things to look fo forward to I, I wonder when China will be able to uh, uh, give up on 
the these market uh, systems that it's in, it had to integrate into itself in order to develop towards this point because because uh, China has gotten pretty close to eliminating poverty but as you described it's it seems like it's still far from getting the uh, resources to uh, become uh, fully socialist and, and like like say the way that the DPRK is yeah it's um uh china uh projects that by 19 uh, by 2049 um they will have a fully developed uh economy um that is on par with every, a, any other economy in the in the world um probably far larger than any economy in the world by then but you know, on par as far as being large is just, I mean, when you're four times, their population is four times the size of the United States. So just, you're, they're going to be large. They're going to have a large economy. There's nothing that the uh, imperialists can do to stop that. But um, more important to the Communist Party of China and to the people of China is uh, the entire uh, population achieving a standard of living that is on par with the most developed parts of the world. Um, that's what they want to do. And they want to do that in an ecologically sound, ecologically friendly fashion, which, uh, of course, none of these imperialist countries ever did, um, which it's a, it's a pretty big task. Um, this guy, there was this guy on your uh, thread that uh, had said that uh, China is now ready uh, to launch the development of communism. And I thought, uh, that's kind of jumping the gun, isn't it? <laughs> the, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't say that. They say we're, you know, we're, we're, we're still 30 years uh, away from even being um, able to contemplate something like that. Uh, so... You know, I believe that China will move away from uh, the market as uh, the economy develops and the consciousness develops uh, to, uh, and the organization, the societal organization develops that will allow for that. And it's certainly not there now. So um, that's really jumping the gun. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, can't blame the guy for being enthusiastic. Anyway, um, Americans can, can, uh, can either become revolutionaries or embrace fascism. Another one from Rainer Shea. Take it away. Man, I've been observing the social cultural trends that Americans have been exhibiting as uh, as capitalism's crises develop and uh, there are I, I've learned about social fascist theory which is, is that social democracy is, is essentially the moderate wing of fascism and that its goal is to uh, consolidate authority uh, uh, and in a way that uh, allows for capitalism and imperialism to continue and that allows for the power structure to continue with, uh, with uh, the caveat being that social programs will be expanded and, and perhaps more, uh, more civil rights for uh, the masses, probably a lot more civil rights for the masses than, than under Mussolini or Hitler style fascism i mean uh, obviously there's that that uh, that big difference but ultimately uh, they're the they're different wings of fascist uh, of uh, of fascism uh and uh social uh, fascism like uh mussolini style fascism comes from a kind of cultural reaction to the challenging of the established social order uh so so many 
it seems like most Americans, including most American progressives, hopefully, hopefully not most American progressives, progressives ultimately get defensive against the prospect that capitalism needs to be overthrown, that uh, Zionism is, uh, might be bad, that the United States might not be legitimate, that uh, imperialism uh, or the, the, the economic functions that constitute imperialism need to be moved beyond. Uh, so uh, so th this is the ideology of the Sanders AOC wing, this, uh, this, this wing that, uh, has, as I, I think, brought about a cult of ignorance where they call expanded social programs socialism and don't really care to look into Marxist theory and that outright vilify the actual socialist project, such as the one we were just talking about, such as China, uh, Chinese socialism. They vilify China as uh, an evil dictatorship, uh, and they accuse China of all these, uh, all these atrocities. The same thing for uh, North Korea and probably for Cuba, too. Uh, the same thing for Mao and Stalin and uh, in all these existing socialist experiments because their priority isn't to defeat capitalism and imperialism. It's to uh, advance their own self-interest as uh, inhabitants of the imperial core who would benefit from expanded social programs and implicitly from the uh, fortification of global imperialism that uh, that uh, such a, a revamped FDR liberalism would create. Uh, so, uh, so this is the trend that uh, America is going towards, especially with the election of Biden, because uh, because uh, Biden there there are aspects of social fascism to. Uh, Biden, Biden's uh, whole uh, toward, toward, towards Biden's aspirations for becoming president and uh, uh, social fascism is uh, certainly what motivates the democratic socialists of America to uh, to endorse Biden and to prop up the Democratic Party. Uh, obviously, Biden isn't a social democrat, and he's to to the right of Bernie, but uh, if if you vote for Biden, if you voted for Biden, you're really uh, an active participant in social fascism. Uh, though perhaps your intentions uh, might uh, be uh, be not not to prop up capitalism and imperialism, but I think it's bad practice to vote for candidates like Biden. Yes, um, I, I have to agree 100%. Definitely have to agree. Um, Americans can either become revolutionaries or embrace fascism. I, I agree with your, your total uh, uh, analysis there, and I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, we're in a worrisome time, but also a time of uh, opportunity. Just depends on how you look at it. Um, fascism is a terrible, tame, uh, terrible barrel to be looking down. Terrible uh, gun barrel to be looking down, uh, and uh, it's certainly not something that we would wish upon ourselves or anyone else. But it uh, is definitely uh, any any objective. Uh, analysis would tell you that it's it's uh, it's on the way, um, and we're going to have to be prepared to fight it. The next uh, point, next uh, topic, topic number seven: declassified segment of the Mueller report proves the former FBI director had absolutely no evidence about who hacked or, more correctly, leaked 
thousands of emails from the Democratic National Committee related to the Hillary Clinton campaign. So this this really another nail in the coffin of the uh, Russiagate hoax. This article comes from Newsmax, which is a, a, a big online uh, a bourgeois you know news concern, um, and reporting on uh, last week's uh, 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 opening uh, or publishing publication of uh, newly uh, declassified parts of the Mueller report. And there's some of astounding stuff that they didn't tell us before. Uh, like this evidence that uh, uh, Mueller had absolutely no evidence um, about who hacked or leaked or whether it was a hack or a leak. They didn't even bother to do the basic looking at the, for the uh, uh, computer forensics involved in the actual servers that were leaked um, to find out if it was a hack or a leak. Um, there were uh, IT experts who, who were forensics experts who did do that work not as part of the Mueller uh, investigation. Um, and they found that it was absolutely had to have been a leak because of the uh, rate of transfer of data that they found. Uh, the rate of transfer of data uh, showed that it was a leak. In other words, it was a uh, transfer of data directly from the servers into uh, like a thumb drive or a, uh, a portable uh, hard drive, um, not over the internet. If it had been over the internet, the rate of transfer of data would have been much lower. So it's simple as that. Um, the, uh, that proof came out in uh, 2017. Is, uh, by a group uh, called uh, VIPS, the Veteran uh, Intelligence uh, um, Professionals. Um, and uh, they're a great organization. I know a couple of the guys who are in that organization. I've met them. Um, former CIA analysts, former NSA analysts, people like that. Um, who turned out to be whistleblowers. Um, and uh, they've got this great organization that does public services like that. Like tell you that the Democrat Party and the uh, uh, intelligence agencies, what I call the uh, uh, espionage agencies, uh, that they're lying to us about uh, the Russiagate hoax. Uh, there was no hack. It was a leak from inside. In other words, somebody who was a, an employee of the DNC leaked this information to WikiLeaks, which is what Le WikiLeaks is for, <laughs> right? <laughs> WikiLeaks is about leaks. This was a leak, not a hack. Uh, so Russia did not hack uh, these servers, as was alleged. The whole, you know, another example of uh, the Russiagate hoax and how it's slowly coming apart at the seams. Yeah, yeah. Once again, I, I wonder what story they'll use to replace Russiagate. I, I don't know how necessary it'll be since Trump has won, has lost. If he won, it, there would probably be a second Russiagate, even crazier than the last. But uh, but uh, they'll try to build upon the Russia phobia that they ingrained into Americans throughout those two years or so of uh, of intense Russia phobic propaganda related to this story specifically. It seemed to be founded upon this flimsy narrative specifically, and they ran with it and ran with it and ran with it and ran with it, ran with it uh, in, until it was. Uh, totally squeezed out, and and uh, and the Mueller report turned out to be a dud. And then this year they 
they came up with Bounty Gate, this uh, similarly unverified claim about how, how Russia is paying Taliban people to kill U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, you, you, brought, you bring this up and I feel nostalgic. <laughs> I feel nostalgic for uh, those times like three years or so, two or three years ago when I was uh, doing all this work of cataloging this, this debunkery and these counter arguments and uh, these holes in the Cold War narrative and putting them on my, my blog. Uh, you, you say that you uh, had encountered some of my articles, talked about them on the show prior to when we met what would you say? What would you say was the earliest article of mine you encountered? I I can't even remember. Um, I know that I've been uh, seeing your articles for a couple of years, and I thought uh, oh, that Rainer Shea, he's somebody to watch out for. But uh, I, you know, I really cannot. I'll have to ask Bob. Maybe Bob will know. I I was communicating with Bob just today. Um, uh, about uh, some little thing that we were uh, discussing. And uh, yeah, I'll have to ask him if he remembers when we first uh, started mentioning you. I'd have to go back over all those shows <laughs> otherwise, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's too much work. Sitting hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, searching through a, for a needle in a haystack. But yeah, it's been a couple of years at least. I mean, it's been like a year at least since we like, first had you on, I think. Hasn't it? A year or so. Yeah. A year and a half. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. The next point, another Rainer Shea. What a prolific guy you are. <laughs> a prolific writer. And that's good. You know, I mean, keep writing. You know, when I first started in my journalism career, man, uh, you know, writing every day, there's nothing like that. I was amazed after a while at just how fast you can get at producing uh, stories. And I mean, I was doing, you know, reportage as opposed to opinionage, which is mostly what you do. Um, and reportage takes a lot more legwork because you've got to run around and interview all these people. But um, still... Uh, the writing part was always really hard at first. I mean, everybody who does it will tell you, you know, they just sit down, pen the paper, and nothing comes, you know, and there's that frightening point of view. And just writing, 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 it does it. So it's really great. Anyway, this one's called The U.S. Will Fall Even Harder Than the Soviet Union Did. The irony of this is that whereas the Soviet Union was destroyed by U.S. imperialist intervention, economic, economic warfare and efforts to uh, get uh, people like Gorbachev in the government who would betray uh, Russian socialism, uh, whereas the Soviet U Union fell uh, because of Washington's imperialist interventions, uh, Washington's regime is going to uh, ultimately be weakened and uh, and may fall one day because of the uh, problems that imperialism can cause internally. It, 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 when a country chooses to uh, become imperialist, it, uh, it, it takes on all the baggage that's afflicted the, all the fallen empires of history. It's afflicted the Romans, the Ottomans, uh, all, all these, uh, the, the, the Mongols, all, all these empires that have ended up uh, falling, sometimes really catastrophically. And, uh, and the, the bigger you come up, the harder the fall will be. So we're seeing this right now you know, in the United States as the contradictions of imperialism cause uh, U.S. society to uh, become especially destabilized within all these capitalist countries. I mean, it, it's because of 
America's role as the as the core of global imperialism that it's it's gotten this bloated military budget uh, where it's uh, where it's in, invested uh, so much of its resources into continuing the war machine rather than investing in uh, keep, uh, keeping its people safe from threats like pandemics and uh, the US has embraced neoliberal austerity especially significantly among even the other core imperialist countries. The US, the US is the only uh, one of these countries that doesn't even have an attempt uh, at a universal healthcare system, which has no doubt greatly contributed to uh, the fact uh, that the US has by far the most COVID deaths out of the whole world. This is uh, this is no coincidence, because uh, uh, when the U.S. decided to become the core of imperialism, it took on this baggage. It, it took on this uh, this responsibility to uh, uh, spearhead all these uh, these global war efforts waged for the benefit of global capitalism, and uh, uh, throughout the last. 50 years uh, throughout the neoliberal era and the post 9-11 war on terror, uh, the U.S. has uh, really uh, hollowed out its, its own society in order to uh, be able to pay for this uh, uh, unsurpassed military budget. The U.S. empire's military budget has come at the cost of uh, the U.S. becoming a failed state. This this is the summation of what I, I'm trying to say. The U.S. has become a failed state because of its role as uh, the core imperialist country, and uh, and throughout the coming decades, we're going to keep seeing the contradictions of imperialism pile up and further uh, U.S. society and turn it into a failed state. One day, the U.S. may well resemble. Uh, Ukraine right now, which has uh, has been destabilized largely by war and by this fascistic government that's uh, that's uh, that's been it's, uh, driven its economy into ruins. And as the as Ukraine has descended into a failed state, these U.S. backed fascist militias have been running rampant and exploiting the crisis. This is something we need to remember as leftists, fascists love a failed state. We're, and we're going to see more of this as, uh, as the, these neo-Nazi accelerationists try to take advantage of COVID-19 or of climate change or of, uh, of all these other disasters that uh, the U.S. is going to continue experiencing. Uh, and as for a time frame for when the U.S. Uh, might uh, really, really fully fall, it, it could be within sometime within the next uh, 30 years. Because my, my article mentions a Pentagon study that says that the U.S. power grid could majorly fall apart within the next 20 years, which I guess indicates that uh, the U.S. state will uh, remain uh, uh, fairly uh, strong throughout the next couple of decades, but at a certain point, civilization itself is going to fall apart, and uh, and it, it probably won't fall apart, be falling apart uh, within countries like China, which have which are on its on their way to building up uh, the productive forces to keep its society stable amid the climate collapse. Uh, but as the climate continues to collapse, countries like the United States will be hit the hardest. It's going to it, it's going to uh, come down upon us like we can't really fathom right now. We we can't grasp the gravity of our situation because it's it's such a slow motion descent into uh, a real failed state. And th this is why the billionaires are uh, buying up land in the American heartland in order to uh, eventually create fortified compounds to flee to. 
uh, when it becomes unsafe to live in urban areas or on the coasts, as, uh, as these countries uh, become more like uh, Mideastern war zones than the, uh, than the uh, fairly prosperous uh, areas that they used to be in America's so-called golden age in the mid 20th century. The golden age is long past. And it, it's, uh, and I, I think it's going to, that the US will fall harder than the Soviet Union did because at least the Soviet Union still benefits from the legacy of its socialist past in, in many ways. And if at least the Soviet uh, Union, the, the society that's uh, come after it has uh, uh, built itself up again to an extent under Putin. Uh, you, you've talked about how Putin has increased the quality of life within Russia, which is why he is uh, so widely supported, despite most Russians uh, really in their hearts wanting a return to socialism. Yes. Um, not so much anymore for Putin, though. I mean, Putin's, uh, Putin's still... Uh, you know, up there, like 60, 65% uh, approval rating, which is any American president would love to have. And I don't think any American president has had in quite a long time. Uh, uh, Trump never got higher than 50%. And he was usually in like 35 to 40% range uh, of approval rating. But uh, the um, it, it's uh, pe people, uh, you know, things have gotten harder in the last few years, mainly because of the economic downturn uh, that has uh, greatly affected the oil economy. And Russia uh, depends quite a lot on the oil economy, although no, it is not a, you know, uh, an international gas station like uh, what idiot said that. Uh, Obama, that, that's what Obama called it, you know, which is absurd. Russia has a, a really highly developed, uh, technologically highly developed uh, uh, and industrial developed, industrially developed uh, economy, and much more so than it did under America's tutelage in the 1990s. But, uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, things are getting tougher there in uh, Russia, uh, due also in part to U.S. sanctions, uh, which have been punishing. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, this uh, whole idea that, you, uh, that the U.S. will fall uh, harder than the Soviet Union did, um, I think that's probably a pretty good bet. And that's obviously what the ruling class is betting on because they're all, you know, running around. I mean, look at in the last year, it was astounding to me in the last two years, actually, the number of CEOs who've quit their jobs, a big corporation, you know, a Fortune 500 CEOs quitting their jobs. Why'd they do that? Because they're running off to their little bunkers. You know, they've been building them for a couple of years now and they want to go, they want to get there. They're afraid, especially of 2020. I mean, you know, just uh, in the first month of 2020, before anyone had hardly ever heard of uh, the pandemic, the, before there was a pandemic, but there was a disease out that some people had heard of. I'd heard of it. I'd read about it, the COVID-19 disease that people knew about in January, but most Americans had never heard the word. They'd never heard of it. Uh, but these CEOs had heard of it. They'd heard that uh, they knew that the economy was going south, uh, that the uh, economy was headed for a depression or had already entered a depression in reality, we find out later on, uh, because the first uh, quarter uh, of depression was uh, the last quarter of of 2019. <laughs> so, and the uh, and the experts from the uh, government agencies didn't tell us that until way late, until the last couple of months. They, 
you know, that was a readjustment of what they had originally said. They had originally said that the economy went into recession, which is a lie. The economy went into depression, but they said that the economy went into recession originally um, uh, in February, the month before the uh, outbreak of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, but they were wrong. So they had to readjust and later on they reported, yes, we were wrong. We had to, we had to readjust that. It actually started in the last quarter of 2019. So the fact that uh, all these CEOs, I mean, hundreds of uh, Fortune 500 CEOs uh, quit their jobs in January, uh, no, nah, that's, that's no coincidence. Um, and actually, over the last two years, thousands of CEOs have quit their jobs. And uh, thousands more of the uh, actual ruling class billionaires uh, have gone into seclusion or, you know, on the run from the civilization. Th this is quite incredible. Uh, good job on that article. Uh, well done and really uh, necessary article. Our last article of the night, or our last topic of the night, uh, this comes uh, from, I believe this is also from uh, the uh, uh, Global Times, the uh, Communist Party of China uh, uh, tabloid newspaper. Um, and the question is, what will the likely Biden Asia Pacific strategy be? Now, Rainer, you and I have talked about this Asia Pacific strategy that the, uh, you know, the Americans uh, have uh, a division of the uh, military, uh, the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, 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 what do they call that? Uh, command. Command, yeah, Asia Pacific Command. Um, so, yeah. Um, Starting in 2017, Trump made a major change. That was, of course, when he became president. Um, he made a major change from uh, Obama, from the Obama-Biden administration's uh, policy on Asia Pacific. The Obama-Biden uh, uh, Asia Pacific policy was... Um, Basically, it, it was uh, focused on shoring up alliances uh, with allies in the Asia Pacific region, um, uh, focusing uh, much more military threats, military might in the Asian Pacific theater, um, and uh, using that to threaten China to contain China, as they called it, their attempt to try to stop China's uh, growth as a, uh, an economic uh, power and as a trading partner to all these Asian Pacific uh, countries, um, which of course uh, they have not succeeded in doing, they won't succeed in doing, because uh, even countries, even you know, countries like Japan uh, and New Zealand and, you know, countries like that that are uh, integral, in, integral parts of the uh, global imperialist uh, uh, coalition um, uh, are uh, cooperating and seeking cooperation with China on these economic issues, on trade issues because uh, it would just be crazy not to. So that was the Biden, uh, the uh, Obama-Biden policy starting in 2011 with uh, Obama's pivot to Asia. Uh, then in 2017, Trump changed that quite a bit. The objectives were the same, but Trump started focusing uh, on uh, trade war, on tariffs, on uh, economic battering rams against China. Uh, Trump focused on uh, uh, ch chain, uh, uh, ignoring 
um, American allies in the region, just basically trying to uh, browbeat and bully uh, allies into cooperating with Trump's trade war rather than seeking those allies uh, uh, cooperation like Bo uh, Obama had done. Now, what will uh, Biden do? Well, there are some indications. A lot of people have thought, well, Biden will probably just go back to the uh, Biden-Obama uh, position. Um, but uh, there's some indications that his will be somewhat different. Um, this article in the Global Times uh, says, in the 2020 Democratic Party platform released in October, uh, which, of course, Biden had a great deal to do with uh, shaping and crafting, uh, there was no single word for Indo-Pacific. Still, when it comes to the Pacific, it's said the U.S. will work to strengthen ties with, the, with and between our key allies in the region, which has been consistent with policies of previous U.S. administrations, the omission of the term Indochina does not mean the Democrat part of the Democratic Party uh, attaches no importance to the region or that it will scale down Indo-Pacific to Asia Pacific. What the de Democratic government, no matter uh, it is under uh, Obama or what, what the Democratic government, no matter it is under Obama or Biden, uh, means what it talks of the uh, Asia Pacific as a broad scope that includes most of the Indian Ocean. Based on the 2020 uh, party platform uh, and what Biden has said about China so far, the Biden administration will continue to see China as the main strategic partner of the U.S., uh, I, I'm sorry, what am I saying? As it will continue to see China as the main strategic competitor of the U.S. As such, it will continue to pay the utmost attention to China as well as the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific region where China is playing a vital role. As the key objective is to maintain U.S. hegemony in the region, the Biden administration will further contain and strategically compete with China. Um, so that's what they say in this. Um, I think we can pretty well um, project ourselves that Biden will intensify the Obama uh, hybrid asymmetrical warfare against China. Uh, he will intensify the Trump uh, policy of uh, instigating uh, trouble wherever he possibly can, as Trump did last year in Hong Kong and uh, in previous years in uh, uh, Zhenjing province in the uh, far north western part of uh, China, where the uh, uh, Uyghur uh, people uh, live, the uh, uh, primarily um, Muslim people uh, who have in the past, been, uh, their youth have been um, joining up with uh, ISIS and uh, with uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, China has paid a lot of attention, a lot of focus on uh, providing those young kids in that Northwest region with uh, proper educational uh, opportunities, trade uh, uh, education, that kind of thing, uh, so that they have some alternatives to joining the ISIS and uh, you know, to joining terrorist organizations. Uh, and uh, also focusing on uh, trying to win their hearts and minds uh, over to uh, the benefits of being a part of the Chinese uh, community. Um, 
So uh, we'll see. You know, I believe that Biden is going to really ramp up uh, all the same kind of militaristic threats that Obama was doing um, and that Trump has been doing um, in his uh, Asia Pacific strategy. So what are your thoughts, Rainer? It sounds like Biden will do a better job of it since he won't continue Trump's uh, really a obsession, counter, often counterproductive obsession with a trade war. Uh, and this is why the, the Republicans have been trying to paint Biden as uh, in China's pocket, as, as a Chinese puppet, because he, he, he won't uh, he won't continue Trump's trade war, right? I, I mean, I uh, from from what I know, he'll he'll just go back to the Obama pivot to Asia strategy, uh, where they were uh, were were trying to uh, militarily subdue China through a multilateral alliance, and and this is in line with the strategy of the NATO technocrats who. Uh, prefer uh, international solutions over uh, th these kinds of uh, counterproductive uh, nationalistic solutions. Th this is what the, uh, the NATO chief said in June, as, as we've discussed, that, that, country, that countries within NATO, uh, within our periphery, should uh, resist the temptation for national solutions and look towards international cooperation for carrying out our goals, which basically means uh, imperialist countries are stronger together, stronger when they work together. Uh, so this is what Biden will do, though I, I don't think he'll be able to uh, undo the, the U.S. loss of the Philippines military alliance that occurred under Obama. Duterte has seemingly been decisively moved to militarily align with China over the U.S. Yeah, I think that's all correct. Um, I think uh, Biden will probably slowly drop all the uh, uh, Trump trade war nonsense. I mean, Biden has been a globalist all his life, so no reason to think he's going to change that now. Um, the uh, economic sanctions that the Trump regime brought in against China, I think those will all stay. Uh, Biden won't do anything um, to oppose those. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be different, but it'll be, as I said to begin with, it's going to be the same goals different strategy, different way to go about it, different road to take, but basically they're both aimed at the same thing, which is uh, attempting to thwart China's ability to uh, uh, grow as a nation, to grow as, an, as a political economy. Um, the uh, article um, from the Global Times also mentioned, which I think is pretty important, that uh, Biden is expected to continue and even intensify the attack on the Communist Party of China, the attack, in other words, on the ideology of China. Um, this really undermines all the nutty ultra-lefts who call China uh, capitalists, you know, I mean, uh, these uh, uh, these capitalists, these real capitalists, certainly don't seem to think that China is capitalist. <laughs> uh, they cer certainly seem to think that China is the greatest socialist threat, which, of course, it is uh, to the uh, American uh, uh, criminal system of, ca of capitalism, imperialism. So... Anyway, anything else on that? No. Good. I think we're done. Uh, and um, thank you very much, Rainer. Uh, great show. 
wonderful contributions by you. Thank you to all of our uh, listeners and uh, viewers uh, and supporters. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. Till then, um, adios. Bye-bye, Rainer. Bye.